Welcome to The Greg Bennett Show. I'm your host, Greg Bennett. And today's episode was with, once again, Dr. Dan Plews. I just really enjoy these conversations with Dr. Dan Plews. He uh, is able to dissect so many things um, in the simplest form. In this episode, we, we, we really target the... Uh, ice baths and sauna treatments and and general health, what we can be doing for ourselves for 2022 in terms of general health. And after this episode, I think I've got to go run out and and definitely get myself an ice bath and a sauna. And I think you will too by the end of this episode. Now, I also understand with this show and these conversations that I don't get to ask every question uh, that you may want me to ask. But there is an app out there called Any Question, and you can go to that app now. And if you go to anyquestion.com forward slash the plus, that's anyquestion.com forward slash the plus, go subscribe there. It, it's free for the first 20 minutes or so. You can go check it all out. Um, you can go ask uh, Dan Plews any follow up questions that I may have missed, but it is a fantastic site. So go check it out. There's Dan Plews there. There's me and other experts in the fields of triathlon, swimming, cycling, running, general health, mountain biking. There's there's so many great experts on there that you can go ask questions to, see other answers from other people. Go check it out. Now, I also want to say thank you so much for listening. I truly appreciate all the support out there and. Like I always do, and I I really do appreciate those of you that are sharing the show, but I'm going to ask again, if you would be willing to share the show, it just helps me uh, attract that bigger audience, which allows me to keep this show going. So I really do appreciate it. And one final thing, remember, success comes to those who endure just one moment longer. All right, today's guest is becoming a regular for the show. He's one of the most requested guests I have, and um, he was on episode 50 and episode 77. So be sure to go check those out, put them on your playlist for later on because they were just incredible episodes in their own right. He's a doctor of exercise physiology and coach of some of the world's greatest triathletes and work with the winning New Zealand America's Cup team. He's been working with gold medal winning Olympic rowers and kayakers. And he's the founder of Endura IQ, father of two, and add to all of that, he's still the current overall age group Ironman World Championship course record holder. And he's also one of the world's greatest minds in the world of endurance sport. Um, He's just got the practical and personal experience, and he also has the science to back it up. And more than that, he's become a good mate of mine over the year, and it's just been a great sounding board for me as well. So welcome and thanks for joining me on The Greg Bennett Show. Once again, Dr. Dan Plews, how are you, mate? Thanks, Greg. Yeah, really good to be back again. Um, yeah, I always enjoy our conversations. So when you ask me to come back on, it's never never a question in my mind. I want to get on as soon as I can. Well, I really appreciate it because you literally have been requested by multiple people um, to come back on. So you are a big fan of many on from the podcast. So I appreciate it, mate. Now, you're, you're in... Um, New Zealand too, right? You, you, summer New Zealand right now? Yeah, summer New Zealand. Um, just in my office looking out, you can see the sea from my window, which is nice. It's thankfully it's not, it's not, it has been really, really hot here. So mm. I did a, I did a podcast, um, last week and it was a beating hot day and I couldn't have the fan in here and I was just sweating <laughs> the whole time. <laughs> so but thankfully today it's not, um, it's not that it's not as hot. So, um, you know, cause the fan can affect the audio. So but yeah. thankfully today I'm, I'm in a better state. <laughs> That's awesome. And you don't have air conditioning, I gather. No, not in, we do in, we do in some rooms in the house, but unfortunately not in my, not, um, not in the recording studio. <laughs> not in the office. No, no. I love so, it, mate. Well, we'll try and keep this cool and, and so you don't get too overheated. Um, yeah. but let, let, let's get going. Previously, you know, we've discussed heart rate variability and, and the low carb, high healthy fat fueling. And we've, we've talked about training intensities and all of that kind of thing in the past episodes. But today being that it's kind of the start of a new year, it's, it's starting 2022. I thought, why not approach it with more an overall health as the top of mind? Um, and I'd just like to con- really discuss what we can do to make this a really great rewarding consistent year if you know what i mean so what things we can we can all be doing to just maintain a good level of consistency and i've also got some questions from listeners and people from the any question app which we'll get to later but let's even start 
by just looking back at this past year um, before we go on? Because you've got Olympics um, that you're involved in. You also took on a, a rock star athlete. So let's start with a couple of those low hanging fruits and then we'll get into the nitty gritty. So Olympics, mate. How was, what was that experience like? Yeah, well, it's actually um, the first time I've not been to the Olympics in a while because I went to, I mean, actually in person, I mm. went to London and I, I went to Rio with the rowing team, but I didn't, I, because I, then after Rio, I switched and started working with the women's kayak team and I wasn't part of the team that went over, which was uh, probably a, a good thing because I don't think it would have had the same level of, of, of experience as other Olympics. And um, yeah, I mean, we, I mean, I have to say like compared to, when I was with the rowing team, I was really, really involved in that team. Like, you know, I travel with them. I do all the data. Whereas I'm, I was play probably a little bit of a smaller part in the women's kayak team. I work high, um, closely with the, with the, the head coach, um, Gordon Walker. Mm. And, um, yeah, and we, I mean, we had a, I mean, as a team, I mean, we had a great Olympics. Um, Lisa Carrington, who is now New Zealand's most decorated um, Olympian. She won three gold medals in the K1 200, the K1 500, and the K2 500. Wow! So um, I think you know, I think it was one of the we were one of the, the I think we were the high the biggest medal tally from any sport. So um, and we nearly got a medal in the K4 500 as well. It was like one or two seconds off a of bronze. Mm-hmm. So I mean, I think it was pretty pretty successful. And it's always nice to just have, play a very small part in in someone's success, right? And I think. You just, for me, I just get so much out of being involved in athletes, you know, of that caliber, you know, you just learn so much from them and they're just amazing individuals because to, to win one Olympic gold medal is absolutely outstanding, but you know, yeah. to win that many, cause she won, you know, she won, she won at London a gold medal. She won a gold and a bronze in um, Rio and then she won three golds in Tokyo. Wow. I mean, it's just absolutely it's just outstanding. Wow. So, um, That's phenomenal, isn't it? I mean, it's over yeah. a 10 year stretch as well. I mean, it's not. Yeah. Uh, it's and what's amazing is um, the mentality is that, you know, she still wants to get better and she still believes she can get better. You know, so anyone who's involved in sport or anyone who's involved in anything, whether it's business or whatever, that mm. kind of, that kind of mentality is just inspiring. I think. Yeah. She just never settles. That's just yeah. phenomenal. I love people that are just at that level and just trying to dissect how they do what they do so consistently like that is just phenomenal. And like you said, it crosses over to business, sport. There's something we can really learn from someone like that. So that was your Olympic experience. Then I also just want to talk about the rock star athlete that you've you've just started working with, and that's Javier Gomez, nine-time world champion triathlete. Basically, I think probably the winningest ever triathlete. I, I think nobody's won more races than this guy and especially at the highest level of sport. And I just saw recently, he just had a, a win last weekend in the Pukon um, Ironman 70.3. When did you guys first start working together? Now it was about four months ago when we first started doing some some work together. Um, you know, he he contacted me via email. He's, you know, he's such a humble man. You yeah. know, he makes his introductions. I, I'm Yavi Gomez. I do triathlon sort of thing. <laughs> you know, oh, yeah. I, I know who you are. <laughs> you know, it's quite funny. That's yeah, awesome. he emailed me. He said, you know, would you be interested? And, uh, you know, we had a chat back and forth. And um, it was a no-brainer for, from my side. I think, you know, he wanted to make the switch to really focus on long distance triathlon. And as you know, that's kind of my, more my area of mm-hmm. expertise as well. And then when we spoke on the phone and I, I always have this policy and, you know, I always have this like no dickheads policy with anyone that I coach, you know, I always, <laughs> the main, the main thing that I always go for more important than anything is that they're just good people, you know, work hard, be a good person. That mantra is just absolute first and for, foremost with all the people that I, I would take on as an athlete. And, you know, and, and he was just such a good guy and just talking to him so humble, you know, and, um, but ambitious. And I would, uh, yeah, I would so say we, we kicked it off from there really. Yeah. You, you, you couldn't get a nicer guy than Javier Gomez. And, uh, you know, <laughs> my first meeting of him, and I apologize if people have heard this story, but, it was back in about 2006, 2007, and he'd just come onto the scene. 
I really wanted to not like him. And, and the reason is, let me explain myself because that sounds awful, but my ego was pretty big and I consider myself to be one of the best in the world. And then all of a sudden this young Spanish guy comes along and starts beating up on all of us. Anyway, we're hanging out at Noosa Aquatic Center and he walks straight over and says, hi, I'm, I'm Javier Gomez. Real pleasure to meet you, Greg. I'm a big fan, blah, blah. And I was like, oh, he's the nicest guy in the world. What was I thinking? <laughs> yeah, pretty pretty hard, pretty hard not to like. And then, and and also, it's like being, you know, when you work of an athlete of that level, seeing, you know, because obviously collect a lot of data and seeing his numbers, I just, I just really enjoy that side of things. And and what's been really amazing is someone who's had that much um, experience, that much success. You know, they're often not that receptive to to listening or new mm. ideas. Or, but I don't know, like I you, literally, you could not ask for a better student. He just, you know, is very. You know, if I ask him to do anything, he will. You know, obviously, he he wants to know the reasons why. But once you explain the reasons why, he'll do it within a heartbeat. You know, he won't miss a won't miss a single day of data. Like records everything. So, and compared to what he was used to in the past, whether I, I get the impression that there wasn't, it was a very different approach to coaching that he had in the past. Mm. He's really taken on board kind of the new new methodologies that you know that I bring with with us being not to, we, you know, we're not together, right? So I have to depend a lot more heavily on on data and him recording that data. Whereas with his old coach, I think, you know, they saw each other every day. So you can take a very different approach, but with, you know, with our approach, we, we weren't really sure. It was always a bit of a trial period at the start to see if it was going to work with us kind of being, having a, like a, a long distance relationship, so to speak. Yeah, um, yeah. that's what it but, is, but, yeah. Yeah, but um, but it's it's worked really well, and it's it's worked because he's been um, so receptive to collecting that data, right, and mm. and giving me giving me the numbers that I I need to uh, to help him. So when you know you talk about having more data, obviously you need to do that. But what were some other big changes that you had to make initially? That were, I mean, were they big, or have you been pretty subtly just increasing and changing the way he works? Yeah, I mean, I guess it was. I threw the big rocks in there quite quickly because there's some things that you can't do anything without, right? Like, mm. you know, I we he has to upload all of his training data into it. So we use today's plan. So, you know, he has to make sure all that's being uploaded and that's where I put his plan and so I can look at the files, I can see his heart rates, you know. You know, I had to make sure he was wearing his heart monitor all the time. Um, and then also his um, HRV. So that, but the HRV was actually quite easy because he was already already wearing an aura ring. So it was just a case of um, syncing it to HRV for training and then monitoring him in, on that. And he's really he's not missed a day of data wow. of HRV data, which has been which has been amazing. And then um, you know, very early days, um, we got him in the I got him in the lab. To, he, went, he went to Madrid, um, went in the lab, did the testing, so did some metabolic testing that was required and um yeah and he was just very receptive to that i mean the i think i explained to you when we talked before like my approach is always with new athletes is i always will try and establish the the, the performance gap so what i do what i did with yavi for example is i will have um i, I have like what i deem as the gold standard for a winning race so what it might be winning kona which is you know that's kind of his big global is being an Ironman world champion. So mm -hmm. if you break that down, what does that mean in terms of where would your aerobic threshold have to be cycling in terms of what's per kilo? What would your fat oxidation have to be? What would your fat max have to be? What would your aerob anaerobic threshold have to be? Um, then running, what's the same? What's your, what's your running economy have to be? What does your aer aerobic threshold have to be? What does your fat max have to be? Mm -hmm. And then I'll, I'll, what I, I kind of get all that data together, then I test him. And then I show him very clearly, okay, so, you know, on the bike, you need to be at, say, you know, you have to be at 71 kilos and have an aerobic threshold of two, like 300 watts, for example. Mm -hmm. um, and you can, and it, it was really good because he could see immediately where those gaps lie, you know, and obviously I think everyone knows that, you know, his swimming and, and running is, is really good, but I think he's struggled to be in, um, you know, in control at least on the bike, on the bike. So, mm -hmm. you know, that's where, you know, it's quite quickly obvious that that's where our focus had to lie and that's where our focus is is currently lying and will and will lie until it's where it needs to be. It's just fantastic to see you two 
operating together. I, I, I see one of the world's all-time greatest coaches and I see one of the all-time greatest athletes now working together. And, you know, Javi must be coming on about 40 if he's not there already, but he, he's probably 39, I guess. Um, he's had an out- 39. I think he's 39 in March. He's 39, I'm, I'm, so he's 38 I'm, right now. Okay. Yeah, I'm, oh, I'm just ahead of him, you see. Yeah, okay, all right. Well, I, my point is in saying that is he's had a long and very successful career. But yeah. he still has, in my mind, I still believe he has a good three to five year window to make some magic happen. And so I think he's found you with time enough. And well, you found each other, let, let's put it that way. And I, I, I think this is really exciting for going forward, just like Dan Lorang found Jan Fredino and they've been a really tight unit and the, what they're doing. And the Norwegians have got their kind of, I, I kind of see, okay, now we've got another one that's going to be thrown into the mix and it's going to give us an outstanding, you know, performances going forward. We, before we move on, one final question with Javier. What do you think of his race in, in Pucon, Ironman 70.3? Yeah, I mean, it, it was good. I think, um, like, it was just a, it was just a starting point, really. And um, I think, um, you know, of course, the competition wasn't wasn't outstanding, but he, um, I think, he had a he had a good race. He had a good run. And I think after Tokyo, and you know, in the, after, with the Olympics, my feeling was he was a little bit flat, a little bit mm-hmm. disheartened, a little bit sick of racing. And the biggest win of that whole thing was just the day before he said, you know, we spoke on the phone. He says, oh, I, for the first time in a very long time, I'm actually really excited to be racing again. Mm-hmm. And I think that's, that's, the, that's the most important because I think you have to have that, that passion, that passion yes. and excitement mm-hmm. to want to do well for anything to happen c- properly. And I, and I think it's just the, you know, it's like the shiny new toy, right? It's just a bit of a change in the way you're training and, mm-hmm. you know, seeing improvement. I mean, I, I download every single session that does and I'll, you know, I'll often send him like his progression. So I'll, I think he's not actually, which is crazy. He's not a very confident athlete. Oh, he said know? that on the podcast, mate. He, he actually, yeah. when, when the second time he came on, he said, look, Greg, I'm not confident. And I I sat back and thought, wow, he's a nine-time world champion and blah, 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 you know, one of the most successful people in our sport probably of all time. And he's like, yeah, I'm not that confident. So, yeah. (laughs) Yeah, which is amazing. So so that's why I I think the data is really good for him because I I show him his progression and I Mm. I show him how he's getting better. And that builds – because he gets his confidence out of – out of his training, really, you know, his training goes well, you show him his training's going well. And that's, um, and I think he went into that race because I, you know, he had the day to prove it. He'd know he'd done a good block of training. I've shown him he's done a good block of training. Mm. So he was excited to race and that is the the best win. And also on the bike, you know, he, he felt like he was in control of the entire race. Mm. You know, he was like doing what he wanted really. Whereas, you know, in the past, and I, and I don't think it's like, he wasn't like had the, the powerhouses of middle distance or long distance triathlon in the pack, of course. But I think that's quite a good feeling as well to actually be in control, you know, on the bike, which is something that we're trying to get him towards. Oh, I'm so excited for you both. And uh, I'm looking forward to this year. Hopefully I'm announcing a few races that he's at and or at least can be on the sideline. I'm just looking forward to that. But let, let, let's move on. Like I said, I want to kind of look at our kind of health for 2022 because I feel like that's the foundation for everything else to build from, you know. Um, And I know in the past we've talked about heart rate variability and we've we've probably done that one to death a little bit. So what I wanted to do is um, (laughs) I asked you a question on the platform, the Any Question app, and I asked, you know, what's been your best purchase? And you said your sauna and ice bath. And I thought, well, what a what a great place for us to probably start with in this episode of explaining the why behind that decision and why you think it's important. And um, so I, I guess let's talk about ice baths. I know there's a lot out there for mental health, um, moodiness, depression, when you, when you look at the dopamines and all those kinds of things. But what is it about the ice bath that you excites you? When I get in the ice bath, I always feel so much better, you know, I just, so that's why, I, you know, when you ask me that question, I just, I just love it. And it's part of my daily routine now. And, um, and I just really, really enjoy it. But, you know, the research behind ice baths is, is, is quite interesting because obviously ice baths, they, 
they are probably popularized by Paula Ratcliffe. People might know she is the, you know, she thinks she, I think she was the women's marathon world record holder at, at one point. Oh yeah, I she believe. was when she ran a two. She went two seventeen, then brought it down to a no. She went two nineteen, brought it down to a two seventeen. Is that right? Whatever it was. Yeah, phenomenal. yeah. So she she did a lot of um. She she started doing a lot of ice baths from the from the recovery standpoint, and obviously in the area of research, it's been it's been researched a lot. But it's actually a little bit unequivocal in terms of whether you know the actual benefits. I mean, most people believe that it was a uh, you know from a reduced muscle damage and it is improved recovery. But it's you know when you look at some of those muscle damage markers and then when we do that in the lab and we're measuring, we'll measure things like um, creatine kinase and lactic dehydrogenase, which are markers of muscle damage. It doesn't really change very much when you do ice bath. Um, but well, like, we're going back to the HRV. What it has been shown to do is it has been shown to um, increase your parasympathetic, parasympathetic activity. Mm-hmm. So if you're so particularly after doing very very high intensity sessions where you have a lot of sympathetic mobilization, and those who are listening are thinking, "What the hell am I talking about?" This is a good <laughs> chance for you to go back and listen to um, listen to the podcast where we talked a little bit more about HRV. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, you, you know, it, it does reactivate the parasympathetic system, which can be obviously uh, exceptionally beneficial. And if you're, you know, and if you're in a very hot climate and you've got a very elevated core temperature and you want to bring it down to like normal levels, like normal homeostasis, of course, that will be very beneficial as well. But, you know, as you rightly say, I I don't use the ice bath very much from a recovery standpoint. Mm-hmm. I use it more from a, a well-being, um, a feel-good factor, and a health standpoint. And as you know, we've, you've already talked about the mood. I mean, the evidence is, is pretty clear that it does improve things like, um, you, you know, it does increase your dopamine, does increase uh, noradrenaline and the uh, beta endorphins. It has been shown to have very positive implications for depression and anxiety. And there's actually just a, pub- a study that was published in the Journal of um, Lifestyle Medicine by Kelly et al. And, you know, they showed that in 20 minutes of at 13 degrees had massive improvements in the profile of mood states of people. Mm. So well, there you go. I mean, it, it definitely does help on, on that side of things. On those noradrenaline and dopamine that you just mentioned, I actually did a little homework, obviously, before this episode. And Wim Hof, who, you know, is kind of the ice man, I think everybody, yeah. a majority of you might know who Wim Hof is. And he's a bit of a nutter, but he, he basically is the guy that really is the the madman behind all of this icing yourself. And he said noradrenaline is affected 540% more through ice bathing and dopamine is 250 to 300% more, which for people who don't know, dopamine is the... It's the plays a role in how we feel. It's the pleasure, you know, satisfaction, the motivation type, you know, that, that, that you get. And the noradrenaline is... Is also in that kind of arousal state, the um, attention, motivation, and all of that kind of thing. So, when you think about, and I know through self experimentation, it's like you just got to do that, and you you walk away from it, don't you? Just feeling like on top of the world. Oh, for sure. I mean, you can be, and you know, that's what I've found um, from my standpoint. As of, you know, I'm not racing as much anymore. I'm not doing as much training, and and you, you know, I know to talk to you about this, Greg. You, you know exactly how addictive training is right and the and endurance training is so addictive to make you actually feel good mm. for those same reasons because you get a lot of the mm-hmm. um those same releases right the dopamine the endorphins the noradrenaline is also happens when you exercise so that's why we become so addicted to it but if you get in the ice bath and just do three to five minutes you know five degrees you get out and you have a very similar response and you it can change your mood completely mm-hmm. um and i think that's 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 pretty awesome. So what what do you I mean on that you said three to five. What what are some of the protocols that you like to do? You know, in terms of time, temperature, frequency. Is there a go to that you like, or is it just self experimentation? I tend to always do three to five minutes. My ice bath is it's basically a chest freezer that I have on a timer. Mm-hmm. So it's set on a timer, then it goes on for like a couple of hours in the middle of the night, really, and then it just turns off again. And it, and it but it, it keeps pretty cold, so it's less. It's generally less than five degrees, but wow. I mean that, that might be a little bit too cold, uh, but it's still pretty good. I mean, if you look at the actual research, like the Schotterhausen reduced a, and produced a meta-analysis that kind of looked at the best from an athlete recovery standpoint, and I think it was around, you know, twelve degrees around six minutes was was best from a recovery standpoint, but that wasn't looking at it from, you know, all the health kind of mm. 
side of things. So yeah, typically I do um, between three to five minutes and it's about, you can range between one and five degrees depending on the time of year. Like in the winter, it, you know, you have to break the ice to get in sort of thing. It's pretty, yeah. <laughs> it's pretty, it gets pretty cold. I'll either do it just straight on its own, but often I'll do it after a sauna. Yeah, that's well. what I was always doing. I was like, yeah. I, I also, let me bump, jump in real quick. For Americans listening, when we're talking five degrees, we're talking Celsius, obviously, which is about 40 to 44, is it about, I think? Uh, yeah. About 40 degrees is five degrees Celsius. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Pretty cold. Um, and then but what, what I've also been doing quite a lot recently is I've been using it just before I go to sleep as well. Really? Um, yeah. you know, maybe, maybe a couple of hours or an hour and a half before I go to bed because it's just so hot here at night. <laughs> it's a real, a real great way to, to kind of take the edge off and then I can actually sit down and watch TV and not be and be actually comfortable, yeah. which, is a, which is really amazing. It's actually really, really nice because, you know, like when re- those really hot days, you're just – you're all you're kind of slightly too hot the whole day, but then you have an ice bath and um, and you feel so much better. Yeah. So, um, and there's something so yeah. about um, when I was doing a lot of it, and I haven't done a lot for about it because since COVID actually, because I was using a neighbour's. <laughs> now we can't see each other, and, and we would do exactly like you said. We would do the 20 25 minute sauna session, and then we would go do. I think we were doing 15 minutes in the ice bath, but we were doing it more at that 10 to 12 degrees Celsius. So, um, you know, that 50 degrees Fahrenheit. And then when we'd get out, I wouldn't allow myself to warm up properly. Do you know what? I, I wouldn't throw my my sweater or my jumpers on or, or blankets or anything to get warm too quick. I actually wanted the chill to stay with me. And I don't know what I'd read. Does does that make sense to you? I don't even know where I got that from. But the idea of not warming up too quickly. Yeah, that that's actually a critical part of it. And I do exactly the same. So, you know, I'll yeah. get out and I'll have a shower, but I'll always make sure it's a, a cold shower. And the reason being is, the reason for this is because you actually want to induce a bit of a shiver. Mm. So the shiver is part of the process that helps you with the increase in metabolism. Mm-hmm. It can also be part of the process that helps you change your white fat into the brown fat and the brown fat is what's one of the main benefits from doing cold water immersion is you produce more brown fat and brown fat is more mitochondrial rich Mm -hmm. it's also it increases your metabolism generally so you if you have people have more brown fat generally high have a higher metabolism because it's better at keeping you warm Mm -hmm. which is one of the main reasons why you know benefit the benefits of cold water immersion because it can increase your metabolism and people often find that they generally lose a bit more weight when they do a lot of cold water immersion so yeah that, that's a really good reason and i do exactly the same but it also i mean just to get on to the some of the other physiological standing standpoints from a health perspective it also when you get into the cold water it it releases endopectin which is a hormone released during cold exposure and it also breaks down the fat and shuttles glucose into the muscle so it's um you know that's also a really important part um of the health and it's so and low levels of um, endopectin has been associated with obesity, diabetes, and um, cardiovascular disease. So, wow. so yeah, I mean, there's so many. If you look at the research of it, there's so much in there that's of benefit, and also like the mTOR pathway as well. So it's kind of the mTOR pathway is one of the main things that people think about when they have fasting. So when you do a lot of fasting, it inhibits the mTOR pathway which is really, really beneficial to, you know, from aut- autophagy and all things like this as well. And the yeah, cold water immersion has been shown to do that, which is one of the main reasons why the research also shows that doing cold water immersion post like strength work where you're specifically try to, trying to um, bring on hypertrophy. So you're trying mm-hmm. to increase muscle size Cold water immersion inhibits the mTOR pathway, and the mTOR pathway is critical for building muscle. So you can actually blunt some of the adaptations yeah. that you that you are trying to gain by jumping in the water um, after that kind of. But on the of on, on the flip side of that, if you go to a sauna after lifting, and you want to hypertrophy, the sauna and heating is meant to help it, isn't it? Yes, exactly. But it's, it's not doing it through mTOR. It's doing it more through the heat shock proteins. Okay. So it's increasing those heat, heat shock proteins that's, um, that's, that's really helping with the, the muscle growth. Because we, we actually do that a lot with the, the kayak team. The women's kayak team is mm. we actually heat the gym 
um, for that very reason, because we, we heating the gym whilst doing exercise wow. can actually help with some of those, particularly during those hypertrophy phases, it can actually be really beneficial. Oh, I love so, that. Um, oh, so, yeah, then, so you're definitely, you're definitely not wrong on that one. I like that. I like the insights of what the, the greatest kayakers in the world are doing. Now, okay, here's a question. Northern Hemisphere people right now are freezing their butts off. Are you still encouraging ice bath all year round? I know you're down in New Zealand and, and you're sweating in the middle of summer right now. Do, is it something that you do all year round or is it something you, it is a bit seasonal? No, I, I do it. I think you can do it all year round. And I, I do it all year round. I'll do it in the winter here. Yeah. Because it's about, um, uh, we're just, as a human race, we're just comfortable all the time. <laughs> like, even we the, are. We're too comfortable. We were talking about that pre-show, weren't we? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like, in, the, in the winter, yeah. in the winter, yeah, it's winter, but you're probably sat in central heating with all your clothes yeah, on. I mean, yeah. how often are you really getting that cold, yeah, right? Yeah. And I think um, I think it's still, there's still major benefits. And, you know, in the winter, it's even easier. If you live near a lake, it's going to be at the right temperature. You can just go just and jump, jump in, in you know? Yeah, because that was my next question was, you know, what kind of ice bath do you recommend people? If people were going to go get one, do you know enough about brands or anything? Or you just think getting a, a bathtub full of ice or jumping in a lake is good enough? Yeah, I know very little about the brands. Um, I think, uh, like, m my the way that I've done it is, I think, is a really good, cheap option. You know, you can buy a chest freezer for, you know, I bought mine secondhand for around 700 New Zealand dollars, and I just got a timer, and, yeah, and then I got, I got my, I got, like, one of the um, Emirates Team New Zealand boat builders, actually, to come around and build, like, a casing around it, like a cedar casing, <laughs> Um which are, so it looks so because my wife wasn't um, my wife wasn't going to be too happy with just having an open chest freezer in the garden. It needed to look it needed to look pretty and go well with the sauna, right? <laughs> so um, so yeah. So but I mean, it's still you know if you've got just buy the chest freezer and put it on a timer and you have it somewhere where it's not going to get too wet. A chest freezer is a deep freeze, right? It's a deep. Like an yeah. old, yeah, okay. Exactly. Yeah. I think, it's like, I think mine's like 700 litres, 500, 700 right. litres. And you just jump yeah, in so it. Yeah, pretty, it's pretty big. Cool. Yeah. I always, um, I always unplug it, but even though it's on a timer, every time I get in, I'll always unplug it from the wall just because I'm like a little bit, scared of getting like, yeah, fair you, enough. Know, <laughs> you know, water, electricity. Yeah, they don't you know. mix. They don't mix. <laughs> you know, well, it's not, not the most, imagine that, like, not the most glamorous way to die. No, hey. yeah. no, I know. It's yeah, like you're, you're in your chest freezer. <laughs> and I did see, um, I don't know if it, where it was on one of your social posts, you did full immersion. Your head went under and everything. Was that, yeah, was I that do just that for show or you that. always do that? I always do that, yeah. So I'll always... So I'll start off and I'll put my head straight under like, and I'll put my head all the way under and then I'll finish with like a, a face dip as well. Just because, I mean, I don't know if it makes me feel any feel any better. Well, it does make me feel better. I don't know if it's actually doing anything, but um, yeah, I like, I like doing that. Quick mini break. I encourage you to go check out any question. You can use anyquestion.com forward slash the plues. That's anyquestion.com forward slash the the plus and you can have 20 minutes of free access to the whole site and you can look at everybody's answers and questions to all the world's greatest experts in all the endurance sports that you can imagine so go check it out that's anyquestion.com forward slash the plus all right now let's move on to a bit of bit of sauna hot therapy um we touched on it just a moment ago. What, what, what else is it good for doing that kind of sauna treatment? And it doesn't matter sauna over steam or infrared, what kind of sauna works better? I guess there's a few, quite a few questions in that, but um, I'll let you run with it. Yeah. I mean, the, the question around infrared versus the traditional sauna, you know, as always, it depends, right? It depends on what, what you're after. Uh, I have a traditional sauna. One of the main reasons is because it's a bit better specifically if I, if you want to do heat acclimation. So if you're, if you're a triathlete and you wanting to go and race in Kona, for example, um, you want to, or any hot climate, that type of, um, the traditional sauna is a little bit better. And there's a lot more research in traditional saunas from the benefits, particularly from a cardiovascular point of view, whereas the research in, um, in the infrared isn't so, isn't so good or isn't as vast. Whereas the, you know, the, the traditional saunas you, it's quite clear that 20 minutes at 80 degrees, three to seven times a week, whatever, you know, the more it, it does almost seem the more the better. Mm. The um, shows to have very positive effects. It's like almost nearly a, a 40 to 50% reduction in your cardiovascular risk because it's mimicking, 
it does mimic cardiovascular exercise. Um, whereas the infrared, you generally you have to sit in there a lot longer. You, it has to be probably almost double. And it's just a different sort of thing, right? You've got to think um, microwave versus oven. You know, it's that that sort of thing. <laughs> but there is a body of evidence to suggest that the infrared in itself can actually be quite beneficial because it, pen- it, can, it can penetrate the shells and the tissues. So that might have a, like a profound effect on some things like some de- detoxifications, fat loss, and even mitochondrial function over traditional s- saunas. And there was um, a study that was a study that was published and it looked at basically the benefits of infrared sauna on the um, micro, micron RNAs. And micron RNAs are the module that's vital for processes like metabolism um, and aging and development of tissue patterning. And it showed that the, the actual infrared sauna was really good at upregulating the micro RNAs um, through like nitric oxide synthase and nitric oxide production. There's, 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 ben, there's benefits to both sides, right? And um, I don't think one, I don't think necessarily one's better than the other. It depends on, depends on what you're trying to achieve. Well, I think the the infrared for most people is an easier one to get into your house or whatever, isn't it? It's kind of it's more of a plug and play, I think. Than I feel, I feel like the traditional sauna takes a little bit more work and setup. Am I right on it that? Does. Or, yeah, it does for sure. Yeah. And there's, you know, there's, you know, and if you look at it a real holistic point of view. The traditionals, there's a more of a um, fire hazard, of course, right? You know, there is a fire hazard associated with traditional. Um, it's more expensive to run, and, and it probably takes up a little bit more space. Yeah. Um, whereas the infrared doesn't doesn't have those things. But you know what? Do you know what you can't do with the infrared? You can't get your incense and put them on the rocks and have a nice smell and lavender <laughs> lavender scent going. <laughs> you got to have your essential oils, everybody. Is that what you're putting on there? <laughs> Exactly. It's so funny. Because I like that. Like when we, a little eucalyptus when to we burn start, your eyes. And- <laughs> yeah, you can, like, it depends on the time of day, Greg. Yeah. You know, if you wanted to uplift yourself, you put a bit of peppermint oh, on there. Yeah. If you wanted at like, night time, you put a bit of lavender on there. Um, it's so funny because when we when when we first got this sauna, Kate, my wife, she was. She's like, oh, we'll put essential oils on. I'm like, what? what's this bullshit? I know my wife. My wife, <laughs> Laura's just gone and got us. We just have a whole. We got five hundred dollars worth of essential oils sitting at home right now. So I'm they're, go they're on, go on. I'm going. They? I'm going through the same thing right now. <laughs> yeah, but yeah, but they're funny. They're expensive. But the funny thing is, is now we get in. We get in the sauna. And I'm like, have you got the essential oils? <laughs> 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 yeah, yeah, you know we can't be in here without those. Oils. You know what's funny is I I was kind of the same. But this, this box of oils all arrived, and um, we all had the you know the recent COVID, you know the Omicron recently. I feel like everybody here in Florida has had it. Anyway, I was grabbing the, I was grabbing I was grabbing the uh, the peppermint, you know, and just rubbing it in my hands and just sniffing that. Oh, yeah. it felt so, so good. good when you have that kind of head cold, or I mean this Omicron is kind of a head cold one and it was just for, oh, all of it. Even the kids, I got a two and a four year old, they were coming over and having their sniff of peppermint. And it was like, Oh, here's, here's dad who was kind of like, what's all this nonsense. And suddenly I'm, I'm more into it than I think my missus is. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. The same as in our house, but, but that's, um, that's another really important thing. I think you, with the sauna as well, is it, it kind of transcends more than just like the physiolo- physiology that we talked about, you know, if it's heat shock proteins, insulin and glucose, whatever it, whatever it might be. Um, I think there's a massive part of, of connection. Mm. Like, you know, me and my wife, we're sitting there at night. It's a great opportunity to chat. There's no distractions. Yeah. Um, and I think that's also a really important part of, you know, community and oh, the tribe and whatever, and just, just having that, that time to connect, uh, you know, I think that's been uh, just 20 minutes and it's, it's perfect, you know? Oh, it's when, really when, when you when your parents have little ones or any parents age, just to have those moments together where it's, you know, mm-hmm. it's quiet and you can finish a sentence or finish a thought. Um, it really does yeah, yeah. mean a lot. Look, I think the setup you have having the sauna and the ice bath there is, the ultimate setup for me that's the ultimate man cave these days i know i've got the zwift bike and a treadmill and that kind of thing but to have the health taken care of um like you've described with the with the sauna and the ice bath i just think is the the ultimate setup so i appreciate you sort of stepping us through that and I, i've got to figure out how we can get it into our tiny little apartment that we live in, here in, <laughs> in Florida. You, might, you might be going for the infrared on the, oh, I know, in I the know. apartment I, I just got to go find a place that has a sauna but having said that even even at our house, when we don't have a massive plot of land, but 
it was uh, the sauna that we had made was custom made and and um it was literally built between the retaining wall and the house it's in a tiny little gap but it's you know you can get it's when you when you looked at it originally you'd think there's no way a sauna is going to go in there it was total dead space huh. but we had it custom made built in and it's a it's a spacious four person sauna now yeah you know, i mean four people would be a bit of a squeeze but you can get four people in there yeah well why not why not? More the merrier, right? I reckon we can get six in there and a couple of beers. It'd make it a party. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Mate, I, I also asked you on the app, um, what was your best purchase under $100? And, and, and I wanted to just follow up with you because I, I, you, you said an HRV measuring app for about $3. So before we go on, what was the name of that app? Because I wanted to go check it out. Oh, that was the, the one that I was talking about was HRV for training. HIV for training. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's less, I think it's less than $3. It's super cheap and it's, it um, measures the HIV through PPG technology through the camera on the back of your phone, you know, validated, validated by me. In fact, published a paper in International Journal of Sports Physiology and performance on that, you know, we compared it to ECG, the gold standard of HIV and also threw in the polar heart monitor at the same time. And it's, um, you know, valid measure and it's, cheapest chips and you can take control of what's going on really you know you can take control of your health and how you're progressing and making sure you're keeping that hrv nice and high and main and um elevated no that's awesome mate i'm gonna go download it as soon as this show is done just so i have it with me um do, do, you, have a, do you have an aura ring no i or don't do you- i don't have aura or whoop um i feel like i'm surrounded by an entire community and world uh, that are either on have both or one of those and i i'd have thought i'd have thought ed baker would have made sure everybody <laughs> who worked at any any questions you know it's part i mean what, what's going on with I his, know. come um, on ed. You, ah, come on ed, you know out. what we did do though just to the whole team that are working at any question we um we just sent them all out a shaki mat and you were the oh, one that introduced mate, me to the shaki right. mat and so yeah we said, you know, we take health and wellness very seriously at any question, and this is a bit of a fun gift. So that is the first gift, but maybe whoops are what we do next for everybody. Yeah. Everybody got them, I think, just the last 24 hours, actually, and they're all like, what's this? What, i got to lie on this thing? My, which was my recommendation from the first ever yes. uh, podcast, yeah. right? Yeah, mate, I've been, I love it. I did 20 minutes before bed on that little shack key mat, and uh, for people who don't know what we're talking about, it's a, a little acupressure acupuncture almost uh mat that you lie on and uh and you can have a neck pillow one as well and it, it, it's quite uncomfortable to get on but then after a minute or two you kind of get used to it getting off it is probably when it hurts the most when they kind of the little needles come out if you back but it's pretty cool for anybody that wants to know i'll put it in the show notes shaki mat i have a question that uh I, one of the listeners um daniel eric larson wrote me and uh He said, you know, could you ask uh, Dr. Dan Plews sort of, you know, for triathlon, what are the sort of the different tests that a a triathlete can do? You know, um, specifically, he was kind of wanting to know about understanding, you know, salt loss and fluid and those kinds of things. And then also measuring his glucose. Are Are there tests out there that you kind of recommend that triathletes go do? Yeah, well, I think the main test that any triathlete can get done is, you know, a proper metabolic test. You know, get into the lab. If you can find a good exercise physiology lab, um, get a metabolic test done, understand where your aerobic and your anaerobic thresholds are truly, mm-hmm. like because it is a physiological event. It, you know, the FTP test, 20-minute 20 te- 20 test, whatever it might be that are uh, making assumptions on a time trial base, are, you know, it's not then typically not that accurate. Mm-hmm. And to really do well, you know, the most important thing you can do as a triathlete is get your training right. You know, that's the getting your training correct, making sure the intensity is correct all the time um, is really important. So I think, you know, going to a lab, swim, um, bike test, run test, um, in the pool, you obviously can't do it, but you can, you know, then in that point, you'd have to use some kind of critical swim speed test, 400 meter and 200 meter time trial and understanding where your aerobic and your anaerobic threshold right are correctly mm. so you can actually prescribe your training properly. So VO2 max interval is a VO2 max interval. A threshold interval is a threshold inter- interval and not a VO2 max interval. You know, so I think that's the most important thing. But then when it comes to some of these hydration and, and salt salt testing, specifically looking at the, you know, the sweat, the sweat, the salt content in your sweat, 
and I know that many endurance athletes will get upset with me when I say this, but you know, we're all adults here. So I think we can all take it. I think it's a load of bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I just think, I mean, uh, look at the, look at the research and I, and I, and, and for sure, like if you ask any endurance athlete, there was a research and paper that was done and like 74% of endurance athletes believe that they should replace sodium losses during racing. So it's, it's definitely people really believe strongly that this is, um, this is a thing. You know, the research just simply doesn't support it, right? right and, yeah. you know, there was a systematic review that was published in 2019 by Hefferman, and it basically said that there's no evidence to suggest that, that sodium, sodium during racing improves performance. So um, it's quite hard to justify. You know, there was a great, there's a great, um, there was a great paper that was, or was it from the book? I think it was from a book that I read. The main thing that you're thinking about when it comes to like sodium losses, we're talking about serum osmolarity. So serum osmolarity is basically the sodium content of your blood or the osmolarity in, on, of your blood. And, mm-hmm. and there's been loads of studies that have been done that look at the serum osmolarity in athletes before a long distance event, whether it be an Ironman, an ultra run, a marathon, and then the serum osmolarity of the athletes after the event. And serum osmolarity is very, very tightly regulated. And in all these studies, there was basically no difference between serum osmolarity before and serum osmolarity after, regardless of how much sodium was taken in during and how much sodium is in the sweat. So if it's really is having an impact, then you surely you would start to see some differences, which you you simply don't, unfortunately. And um, well, there we go. That, that's yeah. been, that's a big one. I like that. I mean, you, you, you know what? Um, I remember Laura and I doing a sodium test. You know, and we're both very different athletes in the way that we we sweat and the way we work in heat and everything else. The results were identical. Yeah, I was like, "What in the world are you talking about? Our, our numbers were identical." And I said, "Well, that just has to be do, has to be a lot more to do with the the lifestyle we're keeping than what we are as individuals and our DNA and how we operate in heat and humidity and how much water we lose and any of that." I was, and I, and and I, I like you. I walked away from that going. Okay, there's got to be something more that we have to figure out here. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and, and were you living together at the time? Yeah. Oh, yeah. This is well, 2015. Following similar diets, no doubt. Yeah, very similar diets. Yeah, almost so, identical. And, yeah. They, and this is the thing: like the the sweat sodium is always very real or directly related to the amount of di- um, salt in your di- in the diary intake. Yeah. So people who have a lot more salt in their diets have a lot more salt in their sweat. Because it's you just you're just removing it and and think about this the it's actually can you think of the removal of salt in your sweat as actually an evolutionary advantage because it actually stops the thirst response so it stops you feeling as thirsty so if the reason we feel thirsty is because we have changes in our serum osmolarity so a two to three percent change in serum osmolarity will make you feel thirsty so basically if you think about what's happening. If you're, let's, how can I explain this? If you've got like water and you remove all the water, you leave the salt in the water, the serum osmolarity goes up and that change in serum osmolarity is what makes you feel thirsty. Mm. But now you imagine at the same time, you're losing the water, you're also removing the salt. The serum osmolarity stays very similar. So you delay the thirst, the mm. thirst, the feeling of thirst. And this is the difference between dehydration and physiological dehydration and like just because you're dehydrated you can you know you can have two to three percent reductions in body mass in, in terms of water but you can still perform very very well and in fact in research that's done in marathons it shows that the people who lose the most body weight during the marathon are generally the people who are performing that little bit better because they can tolerate that dehydration that little bit better. There, there's another kind of side of the coin that, you know, to kind of mm. blow people's minds a little bit, but mm. you, you know, you, you can just, just think about it from that. And, and, you know, 2018, Greg, when, when I won Kona, one of the main questions I got from many people was, um, Dan, how much sodium did you take during the race? And I'm, I said, I have absolutely no idea, <laughs> you know, because I didn't pay any attention to it. You know, I didn't take. Was it in yeah, your sports no. drinks or, or? It was, it was in my sports drinks and, and, but I didn't look at how much I was taking. I was, I was obviously taking some, but I wasn't really paying much attention to it. And I certainly wasn't making sure that I was 
you know, repl- having a specific amount at, at a specific time. And um, yeah, just to be clear, I'm not saying sodium is bad. I think as an athlete, do not avoid sodium. You know, salt your foods, have it in your sports drink because it can it helps with the palatability of the sports drink. It can help you. It can help the thirst response. Yes, it can help yes. you keep mm. on help you keep on drinking, which can often be important. Mm-hmm. Um, which is also really really key. That's kind of where it lies. And of course, there are a few there are a few individuals who may have something physiological going on where they do reduce. You know, they do actually produce a lot of salt in this. In their um, you know they mm-hmm. do dump a lot of salt when they sweat. Like you know cystic fibrosis is a of obvious one, right, where they get a bit of a bit of a lot of salt in their in their sweat. And there's also there was a study that was published that looked at the those athletes who had a low abundance of sweat duct CI channel, which basically it's the when you when you sweat and it's on your skin, you can actually reabsorb that sodium. So many athletes don't really have that ability to do it, so they lose a lot more sodium than a normal person. But again, these people are few and far between, but they do exist for sure. But it's um it's not um I wouldn't say it's it's that common. Uh, you know what? You know what's fascinating. I feel like we've just lived through the last ten to fifteen years of all being about sodium. You know, like sodium, sodium, sodium. And it's one of those we're going to look back and go, remember that sodium craze? It's kind of like the carbohydrate craze we had in the eighties and nineties, where we had carbo parties. I kind of feel yeah, like yeah. we're going to look back and go, yeah, remember we were all nuts about sodium. We had tablets and you know it was all in our drinks and everything else. But from everything you're telling me, it was like. You know, it's important, but not as drastic as what we tried to make it out to be. Yeah, I, I think as, as endurance athletes, we have so much to think about, right? We, you, know, you, know, oh, really, you know, we can simplify things just that little bit. Um, for many people, they can just have a simpler simpler race plan and not really worry about it too much. And you know, I don't deny, I'm not denying that. I think you know, there are definitely some people out there who probably need to pay a little bit more attention to the sodium that's in the sports yeah. drinks. Um, or when they're when they're training, but I think for the majority, probably not ninety percent of people, I think it's probably not something that you really need to be too concerned about. Well, that was a great answer, mate. Now, I I want to keep this show moving on a little bit here. Um, again, I, I saw some of your answers on any question before I, I you know we started this show. Um, for people that want to go check it out, you do a really great answer on supplements. Um, one on sleep. Your morning routine is absolutely fascinating and, and you do um a great answer on fasting so there's plenty more there for people that um you know want more from from you um and i know you'll be over there after this show comes out probably answering a lot of questions from a lot of people and people should understand that it is free they can go check it out it's free for 20 minutes or so you can go on and you know have enjoy the enjoy the app but what i want to do now is i put out a question on any question said so does anybody have any questions for Dr. Dan Plews, and I actually got some, and I did that only a couple of hours ago, but I had um, Laura Sedell, who a professional triathlete in her own right, and she had a good one here. We're wondering where Terenzo Bazzoni is. Um, <laughs> she said, where is Terenzo? We haven't heard from him. We know you coach him. I don't go on social media a lot, so I don't know if he's around. How's that all going? Or is it not your place to talk about well, Terenzo, Terenzo doesn't go on social media that much either. No. Um, yeah, thanks for the question, Laura. I obviously know who, who Laura is. We've, we've had a few, we've met a few times in the Great Lake Taupo. Yeah. Um, so actually, Terenzo was here on, was around our house on Sunday. He came around for a, a barbecue, so he had a really good catch up. But I mean, at the moment, he's, he's not racing. He's not, he's not training. He's developing, um, he's doing some property development. Oh. And whether he's going to get back into it, who knows? But I think for the. Well, we miss you know, Renzo. We miss Renzo. Yeah, he's, he's one of my favorites. No, I mean, he's such a good guy. He's, he's godfather to my eldest daughter, Bella, as well. So, oh. you know, we, we still keep up. We're, we're very close. Oh, but, um, yeah, he's, um, he's currently not, not racing. Whether he gets back or not, I'm, I'm not too sure. Mm. But, yeah, I think the whole COVID thing, being in New Zealand, it just, oh, it's, you know, he wasn't keen on just racing the New Zealand circuit. You can't really, you know. Can't leave, didn't want can't to get leave. back. Yeah. You didn't want to leave your family. You know, you can leave. I mean, Braden Curry, I mean, I think last year he, right. he left and left his family for a long period of time, which I'm sure he didn't like, you know. It's just it's just the way it is at the moment. Mm. So I think mm. he Friends, I made a decision just to do something a bit different. So. Oh, thanks for the heads up yeah. on that. And um, Chelsea Sidaro, who you um, who you coach, um, 
is wondering when you're going to go a sub eight Iron Man because she believes you can do it. <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah, not 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 anytime soon. <laughs> <laughs> not while you're still locked in New Zealand. I think that you can't yeah, even get out. I mean, so. Yeah, well, yeah, that's that's the thing. I mean, I think I've got the. I do think I can go faster than an eight twenty four. I mean, that's the fastest time, and I did that in Kona. So I definitely think there's more in me, but I wouldn't. Um, yeah, who 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 knows? You know, it gets as you know, Greg. As you get more and more involved in other people's racing and performance you become like, you know, it becomes less, yeah, it becomes less of a, of a call to, do, to look at your own. You Laura Sedell actually had a follow on question to that too. She was like saying, how do you balance trying to have a great athletic career? Like you, you obviously have with an 824 in Kona, which is just mind boggling. Um, but you're also coaching some of the world's greatest athletes at the same time. She was curious. And so am I at, how do you balance that? I love training. You know, it's not, it's not an issue for me. So I find that I actually, when I have a goal and I'm training, everything else falls into play. I'm more focused with my work. I'm more focused on, um, on the athletes that I'm coaching. And it also gives, I feel it gives me a lot of opportunity to try sets, to try sessions. I, I really think, you know, one of my greatest strengths as a coach is I can really feel the fatigue of an athlete when I write their training, mm. I can, I can actually physically <laughs> feel it. You know, if I write a session and I'm right, you know, I say I write like a four hour ride and, and, a, and, a, and a run off the bike. Right. And then I'm looking at, say that's on a Monday, then I'm writing the session on a Tuesday. I'm actually, I can feel it within my body. It's a weird kind of, you know, and I think, and I don't know whether that's, is that because I've done so much of it myself? I, I don't know, but I think it's, um, I think it's a, I think it's a real benefit and a, and a strength. And yeah, I don't, I don't know whether, I, you know, now as time goes on, I would say, you know, I'm kind of probably not doing as much, as much anymore. Mm. Um, but I'm, I, I'm so pleased that I've had that experience. So. Yeah. I think it's, I think it's an amazing skill set to have in your back pocket when you're coaching other people going through it to, have, to, I'm not saying every coach has to have experienced it, but I think it's a nice extra thing to have in your tool belt. I also got a question from yeah, I mean, uh, Peter Verbruzic. Sorry, mate, I'm moving on. I'm moving you on here. Peter Verbruzic, okay. uh, who I don't know if you remember Peter, but he, he used to race an Ironman almost every weekend there for a while. Um, he's one of the experts also on any question and he's got some really great answers in there. But he was saying, how would you coach somebody that has one leg stronger than the other? Would you set up a strength training protocol to try and strengthen the weaker one to make it? equal or just train them both the same and just leave it as it is when you said leg i was in swim by run then i was no, thinking no, oh, actual, oh, yeah, i think we're doing actual, actual physical <laughs> leg and i'm pretty sure that's how <laughs> i'm pretty sure that's what he was saying so i was uh i think that my first my first question would be you know how severe is the difference right because i think everybody has a little bit of a discrepancy true. between the true you know the, the two i think that you can, if you get into the gym and you do specific weight and resistance training exercise, you can probably, if you're consistent enough with it and you do it regularly, you can combat that with doing single, um, you know, right side, left side exercises, but doing, you know, 10 reps on the one side and doing 10 reps on the other side. Because naturally, if you're stronger on the right and say, let's just say, for example, you're doing a landmine press and you're, and you do 10 on your right, you 10 on your left, your left side's weaker there's much more load on your left because to get to 10, it's a lot harder, right? Mm. You're probably really fatiguing at eight. Mm. Whereas at 10, whereas on the right side, you are probably making the 10. So you, you automatically will load your weaker side anyway, but you only really achieve that kind of thing. If you're getting into the gym and you're doing those specific right side, left side yeah. exercises. So if it's your leg, you know, doing, looking at doing some single leg, work you know right side left side but i don't think you need to necessarily do like 12 on your right 12 on your left and, and 10 on your right right i think you you'll just naturally achieve it but you'll only get there by by being specific and going to the gym to do it mm. I, great answer i think most of the gym i've been doing myself is really focused on that single arm or sim single leg so you can really identify if there is a weakness um you yeah. know even when i do yeah. bench press these days you know which is uh, a little different than the endurance community but i enjoy sort of bench press and i really do just do a single dumbbell and raise the other hand in the air and just and and i like doing single arm bench press because it really 
one, it forces the whole core and the whole body has to stabilize. Um, but two, I can identify which shoulder feels a bit weaker, you know, even lifting the same weight. It, it, it's a good way to do it. Have you tried um, Canadian press? The Canadian bench? Have you had tried Canadian press where you kind of, um, you, you go, you put half of your body on the bench. Have you done that? Oh, j- j- and, and your glutes. Yeah. And then you, y- yeah. yes, yes, yes. That's a really good exercise. Thank you that for that. For actually, I forgot about that one. That's how yeah. I, I'll do that. Yes. Good one. So I think, I think for triathletes, if you're going to do triathletes, you shouldn't do bench press. So. No, 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 no. I'm just doing it. So but I have better, if, better if looking. If you are a triathlete, you do <laughs> dumbbell press and do a Canadian press. And that's a great exercise for triathletes because yeah. it activates the, um, well, the myofascial slings quite nicely as well, which is great for the energy transfer across the body. Nice. So. Yeah, you know, I, I just stick to single arm chin-ups and pull-ups too because I figure if you do single arm, I'm just kidding, by the way, I do not do single arm. <laughs> I was going to say, yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, right. The, so one of the, one, I don't know if you, like you saw the brew-up, the brew-up came out yeah, today yeah, and yeah. one of the things I've got, one of my new pieces of tech that I've got in the gym is um, a squat cage. Nice. But it's been awesome because I've been really getting into, um, I've been really doing a lot more gym because I just want to get a bit, a bit stronger and I'm not really, I get you know, I'm not really doing Ironman, so I've got a bit more time. I've been, it's great because you can put bands on all your workouts or your, all your movements. And I think band using bands in your workouts is really, really good because it, it means that you have more of a, of a relative, a relative contribution of resistance all the way through the movement. So if you imagine on the cage, you can wrap a band around, if you're doing a squat, you wrap a band under the cage, you put it on each side of the, the bar. And as you go down, there's less resistance in the weaker position at the bottom of the push. Mm-hmm. But as you get up, the resistance gets more and more and more until you're in the stronger position, and you have more resistance. And I found that to be really good. But yeah, so so you should cool. try get try and get it incorporating a bit of band work into your into your routine. I, I think will. you'll really enjoy it. And you mentioned just so people know the brew up, the weekly brew up. You, you do a is it weekly or twice a week? You you, you do a fant- fantastic it's newsletter, um, and I think it's free. Uh, Endure IQ, go check it out, everyone. Sign up. It's a a newsletter that the the Dan and his team put out that really is actually one of those emails that's worth opening up. So make sure you go subscribe and check that out now mate uh, before we go on a couple more rapid fire questions from some of the people from some of the experts you ready to do a few of these real quick from some of the experts wow do i get to know which experts asking me the question absolutely absolutely so um who do we want to start with is there is there a triathlete coach or otherwise that you would like let me think tim don all right i know you guys know each other well from you British days. So Tim Don yeah. has a few. His first one is to pick your favorite child. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's, that's, that's impossible. <laughs> I know. I, I, it's funny because I actually did this one with, when Laura was on the show a few weeks ago and I said, I don't have a favorite child, but I think I have a favorite age of children. So when they go through a certain age, I, I find them a little bit more enjoyable to be around than the other age. Yeah. Well, <laughs> newborns are not enjoyable. Everyone knows that. As a, as a male, like, newborns are just no fun. No, not at all. Not 10 months. <laughs> yeah. At the moment, like, you know, I've got a four-year-old and a two-year-old. And I said this to Kate the other day. Um, I just do not want them to get any older because I just love their ages at the moment. They're just so age. amazing. They're so, it's just got, they're so good. Yeah. And they're interacting and anyway. But yeah, so our kids are the exact same age. Actually, my my one turns two tomorrow, and uh, oh, my three turns four in two weeks' time. So we we're all January, but um, yeah, it is an adorable age. We're we're pretty fortunate. Yeah. So thanks for that question, Tim Don. Um, let's let's move up. Who we got here? Kate Courtney, taco or burrito? Burrito. Yeah, me too. I wouldn't eat. I wouldn't eat either because it's the too high in carbohydrates and. Stuff <laughs> uh, I just pull the taco and the burrito out and eat the middle. I love it. Good <laughs> man. All right, Jan Fadino has got a few in a row here. Let's go. Um, go to the movies or watch Netflix. Netflix. Milk or dark chocolate. Ooh, dark chocolate. Coffee black or white. White cream is my is my go to. Nice. Kama Sutra or quickie. Pardon. <laughs> 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 I know that came from Jan Fadino. <laughs> Kama Sutra or Quickie? I just, when I had Laura on this, I just said anything would do for me. 
<laughs> yeah, you're gonna I, take it. I take, I take you're anything. You gotta take what you can get. Yeah, I take anything. Um, Mark Allen, summer or winter? Ah, oh, summer. All right. Who else we got here? Philip Larosi, one of the one of the guys on any question. He lives on a farm. And he kind of wants to know what's happening on in, in the rest of the world. What do you do with your quality time? Is it friends, family? How do you spend your, your, your downtime, your quality time? Uh, yeah, it's nearly always family. Yeah, I think. Um, yeah. Yeah, like I yeah, generally always spend it with family and, and, and friends if I, yeah, family, friends, I think is uh, my family first and then, then friends also is if I ever have that time. Nice. All right. Um, Emma Plant Brown. You're in 14 day quarantine because of this n- craziness around the world. <laughs> Treadmill or turbo? Bike turbo. Which turbo. one? Yeah, me turbo. too. Yeah. Yeah. I think I would too sit on the Zwift and just hang out. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm much, I'm, I'm much happier running out, running in, running, um, running outside. I'm much, yeah, than, than, I don't mind biking inside. I think it's quite fun. All right. Fi- final rapid fire question comes from a guy I know that's a pretty cool guy. His name is Dan Plews. And- no, no. <laughs> now, um, you've got a couple here. You said, and I'm going to throw them back at you. What book have you regifted the most? Oh yeah. So, so my 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 ones when I did this, they're actually sensible ones. <laughs> I, <didn't- laughs> I know you did sensible ones. Everyone else. <laughs> yeah. Um, I think one of the a book that I've regifted a bit recently is um groundedness by mark solberg and actually chelsea sodaro got me onto the book and since then i've regifted it two times oh. um, and it's all about um the importance of just being oh, well it's like grounded in terms of taking things slow not getting caught up in life hmm. the importance of community friendship not being distracted by social media you know, it's, it's very much like it's like kind of like Buddhist present mindset thing, but I think it's especially in times like at the moment where there's so much noise, to, <laughs> so much noise on social media, mm. especially around uh, the pandemic. Um, I think it's just I, I I found it to be a very helpful book, and there's also like things about friendships and you know who who to surround yourself with, like called like friends of virtue, like people who. Who are like minded with similar values, you know, and mm. it's, it's a great book. So, I've, yeah, I've read, I've, I've I might read. go check it out, see if it's on Audible. I'm into just listening to my books these days while I work out. I actually I get a lot more from it when I'm moving than if I was to flick through a book. My brain works better if I'm actually working out, not yeah. hard, hard, yeah. just, you know, moving. I, I find yeah. I, I, when I'm on Zwift now, I just listen to audio books. Um, yeah, it's really good. Except for when there's a, a green jersey, you know, a sprint, then I have to. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the old fast pitch going. Yeah. All right. Um, and you, here's another serious one you asked. When you think of success, who do you think of? Yeah, it's a good question, isn't it? <laughs> that was a really good question. So I thought I'd throw it back at you. Yeah. You know, I think it's like when I think of success, I, I always think of individuals. I don't necessarily think of like, like someone like Elon Musk, right? I don't really think of someone like that who's just successful in one thing. I, I always think about who who has seems to have it down in terms of like family mm-hmm. work, mm-hmm. good life balance. Yeah. You know, who, who would be someone who, are, who I think of, who has it, who has that down? At least it appears to me. I think someone who just suddenly springs to mind was Peter Atia. I don't know why. I don't, I don't, don't really know him, but it seems like, you know, just from following on Instagram, he seems to have quite a good, a good balance. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, that, that, that's the kind of people who I think of. That's why I, then that's what success looks like to me at least. Yeah, no, I think it's a great answer. I think you you find people that have that have been able to put family and friendships first, and and a social, and have been able to do their business, or you know the way that people have that work life balance and mm. remain grounded, like you mentioned earlier. I think it's uh, extraordinary, and we can learn a lot from them. That the ones that have been able to to do it. Ed Baker would be definitely someone who I think is one of those people, right? Yeah, he's, um, you yeah. know, he's. he's I mean, I mean, great, great dad. He seems to be very connected with his family. Amazing businessman, amazing athlete. You know, he's, he seems to have it. Have and just it all a down all round so, good person. You, you know, know what I mean? Definitely be up there. Just a really good person. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, for sure. Well, I think you're in that same boat. I, I actually feel like a lot of the guests I, I pick, I hand pick because I, I, I look at 
you all as not just successful in one area, but I think you've all found that really great work-life balance and that's why we can learn so much from you guys. Um, so I think I'd put you in that little window as well. So, Thanks, uh, Greg. Oh, of course, <laughs> mate. Well, here's, here's one from Tommy Zafiris. Favourite pickup line? Um, how much does a polar bear weigh? <laughs> what? <laughs> that's your pickup yeah. line? Did that work? No, you have to. You have to answer. So he said, "How much does a polar bear weigh?" Uh, I, I, I don't know. Enough to break the ice. Hello, how'd you do? <laughs> <laughs> have you tried that? Has that actually worked for you? Well, it's every time, Greg. Every time. <laughs> <laughs> I love that you you had that loaded. By the way, he did not know these questions. <laughs> <laughs> uh, mate, this has been honestly, I know this episode was a little bit more just about general health and I really did want to f- dive into the ice bath thing and the sauna and, um, you know, we, we, we have some back catalogue stuff on a lot more on the HRV and the, you know, the low carb, good, healthy fat diet type stuff. So there is plenty of that. I didn't want to sort of rehash what we'd already done. I really wanted to spend some time on that. And I think we, we did a really fantastic job. So I, I really appreciate you doing that. So, you know, what's next for you then, mate? Um, we talked about Endure IQ. You've got that up and going. You're coaching Javier Gomez. What's 2022 look like for you? Yeah, well, not, not much difference, really. I mean, I think we're still looking to really build the Endure IQ community. Um you know, I think that uh, 2022 is a, is all about community for me um, and the business is that really trying to think of ways that we can bring like-minded people together, share knowledge openly, you know, and, and you know, create converts into like our shared vision, which is just like health and performance. And I think that's one of the main things that we're going to be focusing on. So bringing people into our squad and making sure and, and trying to just connect people all around the world mm. with, um, you know, trying to live – healthier lives whilst just kicking ass on the performance side as well so people can check that out on endureiq.com and um, come join the tribe perfect i'll put that in the show notes uh, endureiq.com also listeners can reach out to you at anyquestion.com forward slash the plues that's where they can find you and they can sign up and ask you questions there because i know i don't get to every question that people want to have um so go check it out there but Dan, mate, thank you so much again for your time and just sharing your journey and, you know, all your knowledge, mate. It's it's always fantastic. I really appreciate you coming on. No problem. Thanks for having me on again, Greg. Yeah, no, you're more than welcome. And thank you, everyone else, for listening. Um, you can find all the show notes and, and timestamps and links and all the coupon codes at bennettendurance.com forward slash media. Thanks a lot for listening. If you enjoyed the show, your support would truly be appreciated. You can visit the Patreon page or you can subscribe with your podcast app of choice. Don't miss the next episode, so subscribe and be notified. For show notes, if you want to know more, please visit bennettendurance.com. I'm Phil Liggett, and on behalf of Greg Bennett, here's to the next time, and I hope you will join Greg again very soon.